much for joining us. Um, I'm Melanie Brown. I just wanted to say hello um, because I'm going to be um, presenting largely the second half of our uh, slide deck later on um, during this session. Um, but I did also want to say um, that I really appreciate everybody coming out and we want to encourage as many questions and conversation as possible. So we have a few points during the session tonight where we will, you know, ask for your feedback and, and so please do take advantage of that chat box because we're really eager to hear your ideas on the topics we have today. Um, Emily, I just wanted to zoom in and say hello and I, I'd like to turn it over to you. We're going to talk about some cultural different differences and the impact and perceptions of those cult cultural differences. We're also going to cover supporting international students learning and how we can reimagine and revise our teaching philosophies based on working with international students. Some of the goals of our presentation are to understand how cultural differences can impact the classroom, explore pedagogical and classroom management strategies for supporting international students, and then also to discuss how everyone's teaching philosophy may impact student experience, given that there are cultural differences in the classroom. All right, so the way that we decided to frame cultural differences is using Hofstede's frame. Some of you may be familiar with his work. There are a lot of different ways to slice cultural differences. You've got Trumpenars, Hall, uh, a lot of different uh, researchers. But this is the one that we decided to go with for this presentation. I realize that there are a number of criticisms of his work, but I also think it can shed some valuable light on cultural differences. So he's got now six. It used to be four, then it was five, and now it's six different different indices that he looks at in looking at how different cultures interact or think about a different um, perspective. And so we're going to go through those one by one. And the first one is power distance. So in high power distance cultures, hierarchies are accepted. So you can think of these as more um, vertically centered cultures. So there's uh, people at the top, people at the middle, people at the bottom. Um, a potential impact of this is that uh, students who come from high power distance cultures might be less willing to ask questions or, or challenge some widely accepted ideas because there is that, they do respect that distance between higher or low level, what are, what are perceived to be higher low level folks. In low power distance, hierarchies and inequalities between people are not accepted. Sometimes students may be more communicative with their instructors, so they may uh, ask more questions, see you as more of an equal rather than, um, rather than someone in an authoritative in a role of authority. Some examples of high power distance cultures are China and Saudi Arabia. Some examples of low power distance cultures are Norway and Iceland. So next we have individualism versus collectivism. As you may imagine just from the words individualism and collectivism, in individualistic cultures the focus is more on what benefits the individual person rather than the larger group of people. In collectivism, the focus is more what benefits the most people in someone's in-group. And again, thinking about research, in-group can, um, can be constructed in a number of different ways and it varies from um, context to context. But if, somebody's, if somebody feels that somebody else is in their in-group, their, their goal may be to benefit all of the people rather than just themselves. So your impact on individualism could be that students are primarily concerned about how things affect them, not everyone in the class, so they may make comments that are more uh, self-driven rather than group-driven. And in collectivistic cultures, if you have someone from a collectivistic culture, they may you may have someone who's less willing to give their own opinion if it collects with someone they see as an in-group member. So if they have someone else who they see as a peer in, in the class, they may be less willing to, to disagree with that person. And some examples of individualistic cultures are the United States and the United Kingdom. And collectivistic cultures, two examples are Taiwan and Chile. And I do want to note at this point, some of this, um, one of the big criticism of Hofstede's work is that um, within cult culture can be fragmented and culture can be different whether you're in different parts of a country and so I take all of this with a grain of salt this is just some generalizations but it might help you as you're moving forward with students and, and thinking about how 
how students from different cultures may be reacting to different things in the classroom. Next we have masculinity versus femininity. In masculine cultures, uh, the value is placed on material rewards, uh, achievement, and folks there want to be the best. So this goes back to, to, to Deborah's comment about how some students feel they might, they want to, they need to achieve an A. So that may, they may have come from a more masculine culture. In feminine cultures, um, there's more of a value placed on cooperation, liking what you do, and being more modest. So in, in this case, you may have students who enjoy more group work than individual work. And some examples of masculine cultures are Japan and Italy. Some examples of feminine cultures are the Netherlands and, again, Chile. The next, the next uh, index that Hofstede offers us is the Uncertainty Avoidance Index. And in, in high uncertainty avoidance countries, there are very strict expectations of behavior. So people are expected to behave in a certain way and not deviate from that type of behavior, deviate from that behavior, expected behavior. And folks in these countries, or in these cultures, can be intolerant of differences in beliefs. So you may, if you have a student from a high uncertainty avoidance culture, they may be less willing to accept differences of opinion. In a low uncertainty avoidance culture, there's more comfort with uncertainty. And so students are more comfortable, maybe more comfortable disagreeing with each other. And they may, more, be, they may be more accepting in differences of beliefs. So one possible impact in a, if you have a student from a low uncertainty avoidance culture is that the student may be less focused on maybe less focused on just learning facts and would be more would prefer to interpret the data rather than just being told this is how it is. They may be more interested in saying, well, this is my slant on this data. Some high uncertainty avoidance cultures are Greece and Turkey. Some low uncertainty avoidance cultures are Denmark and Singapore. The next um, group that we have are the long-term versus short-term orientation indices. And in a long-term orientation culture, they, they keep both the past and the present in view and have a very pragmatic approach to problem solving. So they're not only considering their history in the world and uh, where their culture has been situated previously, but they're also looking towards the future and all, always very pragmatic, not very belief or truth driven. Um, one of the possible impacts with a long-term orientation culture is that students are likely aware that their research builds on the research of others and are interested in building knowledge because they have that, again, that pragmatic approach and a respect for what's happened in the past. In short-term oriented cultures, change can be a little bit difficult. Um, Time-honored traditions are prized above all. There's a focus on normative thinking and uh, big T truth. So one possible outcome is that students will show respect for instructors as they've earned a time-honored degree and a position of authority. Some examples, and this may surprise you, some examples of long-term oriented cultures are Belgium and Japan, and some examples of short-term oriented cultures are the United States and Finland. Finally, we have uh, Hofstede's newest di uh, dimension, which is indulgent vers indulgence versus restraint. Um, in indulgent countries or cultures, the prioritization is on leisure time and having fun. Folks from these cultures tend to be very optimistic. So one possible outcome is these students would be engaged in the classroom and bring a positive outlook. In countries where the cultures are more restrained, people tend to think that they should control their desires and there's less of a focus on self-gratification. And they can be more pessimistic. So the impact here, you may have students who are more goal-oriented and self-sacrificial. Some examples of countries that fall high on the indulgence scale are Nigeria and Mexico. And countries that fall low on the scale, so fall more towards restraint, are Morocco and the Czech Republic. Great, thank you, Emily. Um, and, and I also um, I wanted to mention that some of the frames that you were presenting there did recall for me some of the comments we had at the beginning um, of this session. You know, the, um, the idea of proof versus opinion you know, these sort of rigid beliefs um, versus, um, you know, what counts as evidence versus what counts as opinion, and some students actually seeing them as one and the same, um, and, and 
considering that more or less fixed or fluid. And as Emily mentioned too, you know, certainly our goal uh, is not to essentialize cultures here and recognize culture as a fluid, dynamic, ongoing process, you know, lifelong, um, and develop cultures, subcultures across, you know, time. These are the references if you want to get out your magnifying glass and look them over sometime. <laughs> um, but you'll find everything I mentioned uh, that we cited uh, is, is in here. Um, including that book uh, from this year. It's called Teaching Across Cultural Strengths, a guide to balancing integrated and individuated cultural frameworks in college teaching.